Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to SFF 180. Thomas here, your host as always. Thanks for joining me. This is the second of two back-to-back -back episodes of Daily Shorts, in which I'm reviewing the finalists in the short story categories for this year's Hugo and Nebula Awards. And in this part, I'm happy to say we're getting around to some much better stories. But while I suppose you could say that yesterday's video had the controversial stories, and this video has the good ones, I gotta tell ya, even taking into account the short stories I liked out of this year's batch, there is just not a truly great story among them. And that's a shame. Overall, this year's crop of award-nominated short stories was anything but a bumper crop. And I did, in fact, read a number of short stories in 2018 far better than any of these. Maybe I'll make them a subject of the next Daily Shorts to give you guys an idea of what everybody missed or just overlooked. Oh well. Anyway, let's get on with it. First up, we have Sarah Pinsker's The Court Magician, up for both awards. It's a little parable about what it's like to lose a part of yourself, in this case literally, when you allow yourself to be seduced by the promise of power. Sarah is one of the genre's most gifted practitioners of short fiction, but this one isn't as sublime as the story she won for last year, Wind Will Rove. Still, it has plenty of imagination and a haunting quality. A young urchin who has mastered sleight of hand street magic is offered an opportunity to learn real magic in the royal court. He is given a one word spell and told to be at the regent's beck and call. Over the years, as he does the regent's bidding without question, his use of the spell causes him to lose something. Maybe it's a body part or a chambermaid that he fancied is suddenly gone. Every time it happens, he, he frets over the consequences of the spells he's cast on the regent's behalf, and naturally over their cost to him personally. But he rarely frets for long, always choosing his life of so-called privilege, always sure that the true secret of magic will be revealed to him if he perseveres long enough, until the day he finally reaches his breaking point. The symbolism here is pretty easy to grasp, but... Pinsker's choice of the fairy tale idiom makes it not seem quite so message heavy, probably because we all remember from growing up that fairy tales are all about the moral messaging, and so it's not unexpected. I like this all right, but I wish it hadn't ended on such a vague note, and perhaps that Sarah had not kept her character at so much of an emotional remove, which kept me from connecting to his situation in any meaningful way. And yet is an inspired tale with real flashes of brilliance, as A.T. Greenblatt places a classic haunted house premise into a science fiction framework. The protagonist is a disabled theoretical physicist who has returned to a creepy old house from their childhood. Once upon a time, they'd entered the house on a dare, while unbeknownst to them, their little brother had snuck away from home to follow and gotten himself hit by a car. As an adult, the physicist is now convinced that the house is actually some kind of hub for alternate realities, and they're determined to unlock its secrets and make a groundbreaking scientific discovery. But the house may not be ready to let those secrets go, and it may even have a trump card it's ready to play to keep those secrets safe. Greenblatt's use of the house as a device to examine the hero's past is a fresh and effective way to explore the theme of how life is a series of decision points, which is what multiverse stories tend to be about generally. Sarah Pinsker did it with satire. In her great story from last year, And Then There Were N-1, in which hundreds of versions of herself from alternate universes held a convention at a hotel. In this story, Greenblatt's house is haunted by everything in the hero's past that has caused trauma and guilt, such as school bullies and dysfunctional parents, and of course, the kid brother. And the hero's efforts to solve the house's true nature become, in turn, a personal journey to exorcise their ghosts. There's a real atmosphere of dread and some great goosebump moments. Some readers might not care for the second-person voice, which I agree is hard to make work, but here I found it a suitable tool for keeping the reader in the hero's head as we follow them on a bewildering path through multiple timelines. It's a tricksy little tale that pays off handsomely. Alex Harrow's A Witch's Guide to Escape a practical compendium of portal fantasies, is both a celebration of reading and an indictment of an educational and foster care system that often cannot meet the needs 
of the kids it purports to help and lets many of them fall through the cracks. The narrator is a public librarian who is also a witch. In her own words, one of the two types of librarians there are. The other type isn't so flattering, but hey, address your complaints to Alex Harrow. The narrator can feel the way the books in her library reach out to potential readers, can hear the thoughts in their pages, because the books really do have an inner life. A sullen teenage boy keeps coming back to the library, checking out and renewing various fantasy and adventure stories, pure escapism, but through other books and an encounter with the boy's caseworker, a picture is painted of a truly depressed and aimless young man, seeking solace and a hiding place from his life. The narrator's sympathy for the boy extends to some serious rule-breaking. She pretends not to notice one night that he's hidden himself under a table and locks him in overnight. Tellingly, no one misses him. And she eventually considers allowing him access to one of the library's hidden, truly magical books, whose existence is only known to librarian witches at all, and which are kept under lock and key. There's a real sense of the redemptive and healing power of reading in this story. But there are a couple of criticisms that could easily be made as well. For one thing, because the teenage boy here is black and the narrator is presumably default white, some critics have pointed out there's kind of an uncomfortable white knight, white savior vibe to the whole thing. Also, Harrow literalizes the ending of the story more than she needed to, and there's a valid point to be made that escaping whole hog into realms of fantasy, while it might be therapeutic, isn't how you're supposed to deal with real-life problems. It's just running away. But there's another way to take in this story, which is that sometimes running away from certain problems is all you can do. Also, even if you understand that books and stories can only do so much, the therapeutic value of immersing yourself in them can't be dismissed. When I was a shy and awkward and often unhappy adolescent, the books I escaped into helped me connect to ideas and worlds bigger than myself and bigger than the confines of my everyday existence. They brought me a lot of happiness when just being a kid didn't, even as I understood naturally that they were all make-believe. And as for the narrator here, well, what lover of books hasn't wanted to spread the love of reading to literally anyone else? I see the story as a celebration of all that, with the message that no matter how badly life is telling you everything is a dead end, there really is more out there. Next up, the Rose McGregor Drinking and Appreciation Society is another fractured fairy tale by T. Kingfisher that's cute and funny, even though it really only has its one joke. Contrary to the fairy tale trope where young human ladies are seduced and abandoned by hot and sexy fae who leave them lonely and pining, Rose is a bold, sexually adventurous young woman who actively seeks out trysts with the Fae and then dumps them, leaving them the pining ones. Oh, but of course they're not really pining. Like I said, charming and witty and actually kind of gentle in the way it spoofs fragile male egos. You know, but beyond that, it's not Hugo material. Finally, I guess fractured fairy tales with long titles must be trending this year, but if, if these kinds of stories are your jam, then you'll be a lot better served by Brooke Bolander's genuinely funny The Tale of the Three Beautiful Raptor Sisters and the Prince Who Was Made of Meat. In fact, this one is my own top pick for my final Hugo vote. Like the T. Kingfisher story, there isn't much to it beyond being a witty little riff on the fairy tale tradition, but it's just a better example of that kind of story. The humor is sharper and funnier, particularly the way Brooke Bolander just establishes this very traditional medieval European fantasy setting and then just casually plops a, a trio of intelligent velociraptors into the middle of it like they totally belong there. The story details what happens when a dim-witted prince, off riding in the woods, stumbles onto said raptors and is too completely sheltered and ignorant of the outside world to know that he ought to be afraid of them even when they eat his prized stallion right in front of him. The raptors, in turn, are so baffled by the prince's lack of fear that, rather than coming to the obvious conclusion that the man is just stupid, they wonder if he might be part of a sneaky human plot to make them let their guard down so a larger army can be deployed to kill them. Against her better judgment, the youngest raptor sister actually lets the prince ride her back to his castle, where she hopes to gather intelligence about what the humans might be planning. She creates quite a sensation, but the prince is betrothed 
appears to be the only living person in the castle with a brain in her head. And so, seeing an opportunity to escape the dreary life she has been committed to, married to a complete chowderhead of a prince, she befriends the young raptor, and just in the nick of time, too. This was all just completely adorable, and it had a number of laugh-out-loud moments. If you haven't sampled Bolander's writing, you're definitely missing something. And there you have it. Yeah, a few good tales here and there, but overall, a middling year for short stories on the Hugo and Nebula ballads, if not in the genre overall. I want to thank you all for watching. I hope you're having a lovely holiday, if you celebrate it. Now remember the most important part, these are reviews, you will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please slam that like button, share the video far and wide with all of your SFF reading friends, and above all, please subscribe. If you haven't done so yet, that is how the channel grows. You can also support the channel at my Tee Public store and at my Patreon, where recruits in the Winx Army get little perks like getting to see some of these videos early. I want to thank all of those folks for their additional support. It is much appreciated. I want to thank you guys for being the very best viewers in all of BookTube. And until I see you tomorrow for the mailbag, happy reading.